I'm here with John Dart, who gave the Castro Viejo lecture. John, I want to. I want to. I know we're we're here for me to hear you talk, but humor me. I want to talk a little bit. When when I was a a cornea fellow back in the Holy Roman Empire, um, I would my my, my my I I was with the Greek Empire. Yes. Uh, the, 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 there's my, my worst patient. Absolutely classic story. Contact lens wear when swimming in a in a pond, uh, wearing contact lenses as one should never do. I, as a result of an infection he had, I grafted him once, and then I had the pleasure of grafting him a second time because the infection recurred in the graft, and it was this awful, uh, extremely painful problem that you spoke about today. Can I have you to sort of give me the the, the lay of the land here? Yeah, well, the disease was unheard of in the, in the 60s, first described in the 70s. And in agricultural workers, people who'd had uh, eye trauma f with contaminated water or soil. And we, we still don't know or understand why it started to become much more common. The increase in, uh, in uh, contact lens wear throughout, you know, Developed countries. Wait, first of all, we, we, uh, we haven't said yet what the, the disease is. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about a protozoan. It's a free living protozoan. Okay. lives in uh, damp water, soil, seawater, uh, pond water, as you mentioned. Swimming pools are usually chlorinated. It survives chlorine, so it's present in swimming pools, and it's present in domestic tap water. Um, it likes feeding on bacteria. It doesn't really, it's not a parasite, but if it uh, gets exposed to the eye, in the right circumstances, it can start to invade the eye and it will feed on cells in the cornea. Um, it rarely escapes outside the cornea. It doesn't seem to like vascularized tissue. So there have only been, I think, eight reported cases of the organism getting outside the cornea into the sclera or into the inside of the eye. Having said that, um, in immunosuppressed patients and in the occasional unfortunate person with encephalitis, amoeba can get up probably through the cribriform plate in the nose, into the brain, and cause a fatal encephalitis. Most patients die, and in patients who are immunosuppressed, it can affect the lungs and the skin. But those are much less common than the eye problem. So acanthamoeba and the eye are, is the commonest manifestation of the organism in the eye. In now, the, sorry, in, in, in the human. The, 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 um, the, the treatment for it um, has been unsatisfactory to date. Can I get you to talk about that? Yeah, it's still unsatisfactory. When, when the, um, we actually, this is one of the few diseases where we have data on the outcomes of about 15 or 20 patients before any sort of specific treatment had been developed or was used at all. And uh, most of those patients went uh, blind or had multiple keratoplasties, corneal transplants. And then in the 80s, um, one of my mentors at Moorfields, Peter Wright, uh, with Barry Jones, they introduced propamidine or broline, which was an over-the-counter anti-infective. And that had some efficacy against amoeba. Then in the, the late 80s, early 90s, there were outbreaks of amoeba, both in the United States and in the UK. And uh, I was had just been appointed a consultant then. And I, I took over a a retinal service as a consultant. I'm a corneal specialist, so I had no corneal patients, and I did all the, uh, I had all the corneal patients nobody else wanted to look after, which were the infected corneas. <laughs> and the patients were doing terribly badly. And uh, at about that time, one of my colleagues, now a colleague, who was a junior called Frank Larkin, had treated one case. He was doing a thesis on amoeba at Bristol, and he, he treated one case with PHMB, which was a Pooled it, swimming pool disinfection alternative it's to chlorine. Uh, no, it's not polyquad. It's polyhexanide, uh, polyhexamethylbiguanide um, are the alternative names for it. And uh, polyquad is, is, is a different, uh, different disinfectant. And um, we, um, we started to use that in patients, but at a much higher concentration that than it had been used as a disinfectant. It's used quite widely, actually, in ENT to cleanse surfaces, but not as a medicine as such. And um, ICI, who manufactured it, uh, didn't want to know about human treatment. Our hospital chief executive 
agreed to take on the responsibility and we treated, started treating patients and it turned the disease around. It made an enormous difference at that time. People having the sort of problems you described with the recurrent coronary infections, we could clear those up in grafted eyes and we, uh, we reduced the keratoplasty rate down to, um, it's about for, for therapeutic grafts for perforations, down to about 10% and it had been much higher before that sort of in the 50s, 60s percent. There, in fact, there'd be no, no medical cures. I think only one medical cure in the first 20 patients treated it was very low. So PHMB really turned things around. It's a biguanide, and um, another biguanide introduced by a colleague of mine in the, in the, in the UK, introduced chlorhexidine. We, um, we've used both. Uh, at the time, we put, it, put uh, concentrated um PHMB into little bottles, we sent those all over the world. And since then, uh, the biguanides, either PHMB or chlorhexidine, have been the most widely used treatments uh, recommended by the um, Centers for Disease Control on their website, College of Ophthalmologists on their website, with or without the use of a diamidine, which is broline most widely used, but also uh, another drug called desomidine, which is sort of French broline, it's hexamidine, it's a similar drug. We are doing a randomized controlled trial because you say the outcomes are still not great. A quarter of patients will lose sight, you know, to the effect that it, it's really sort of less than 2080 or worse. So those outcomes are not great. And um, uh, we've uh, got a randomized, there have been no randomized controlled trials done. We've got a new formulation of PHMB, um, which has been, the development of this has been part funded by an EU grant, uh, the pharmaceutical company is called CP. They're doing this as a sort of research project. Um, we started work in about 2007, and um, the end result will be, if this trial is successful, to license the drug as a pharmaceutical within Europe. So we've gone through the European Medicines Agency. We've gone through a rat model, um, cell culture model, short-term rabbit, long-term rabbit, and a human phase one and we have 20 odd patients to get uh, recruited out of the 130 we need for the randomized trial. We're comparing 0.08%, which we hope will penetrate better, uh, with, a, with a placebo against 0.02 and broline, which is the sort of most widely used preparations worldwide. So I hope to have the outcome. I wish it had been ready by now, but we hope to have the outcome soon. And not only will we be evaluating the drug, but we have a very detailed protocol which we follow in the trial and we um, interviewed I think about 50 ophthalmologists at a large European meeting EU cornea which a lot of US um, there are a lot of US participants there and there were 50 different protocols you know, different drugs being used diff drugs being used in different ways and nobody has really a, a, you know had standardized any sort of method of approach and I think a the protocols that are used for randomized controlled trials, they're there to uh, evaluate drugs, but if your results aren't as good as the results that uh, have been published in the trials, you might want to think about using the protocols that are used in the trials, which is what we've done at Moorfields for fungus keratitis, which is not so common in the UK, and we've used the mycotic ulcer treatment trial protocol and drugs, which was um, a joint effort between um, Proctor Foundation and um, Madurai in India, where they have, I think they randomized 400 patients. So uh, I think I hope there'll be a lot coming out of the trial. What I'm, uh, what I'm going to be talking about in the Castro lecture is treatment and the evidence base for it. So I've used about 60 references, uh, a lot of them from my own team. We've published 31 papers in the last 25 years <laughs> on amoeba and de dealing with everything from the epidemiology um, through to um, to, to, to treatment, but I'm going to focus on treatment tomorrow and give the evidence base for why I do what I do and why we're doing what we're doing in the protocol, which I hope will be useful to AO members. John, treating the the motile beasties is 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 difficult but possible. Treating the the cysts is a is a is a different no, that's, that's story. So my 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 my, my question is um, is there is there any mechanism to, and is there anything to be gained by um, getting the, the cysts to reactivate before treatment? Um, well, you're quite correct in stating the trophozoites. They're actually quite easy to treat. Uh, I mean, almost any antimicrobial will treat a trophozoite. And that 
there's a bit of an old chestnut about waking up the cysts um, in that you know, steroid use was shown to reactivate uh, cysts and they would, in vitro this is, nothing's been shown in vivo and the reason for pushing the baguanides currently as the best drugs uh, to use are that they do actually treat, treat cysts very effectively in vitro and there's been only one paper showing resistance in one strain which was associated with a, um, a slightly altered genotype in that strain. So there's only one publication you out of a lot looking at um, resistance. And the resistance in, in vitro doesn't actually happen. Uh, it varies a bit from study to study because nobody is fixed on a method of growing the organism to, in a standard way. And for example, if you grow the cysts on um, medium instead of nephrocin cystic mediums, instead of starving them, you get a much more susceptible <laughs> cyst than if you starve the cyst, which is what we do when we're doing the, uh, doing the test. Um, I think the issue with biguanides is that they're big molecules and they don't penetrate deep enough. And if we could improve penetration, we hope the higher concentration will do, do that. There may be other, there are other ways potentially of getting drugs in deeper. Um, new molecular envelope techniques which may be applicable. But for now, we'll see what we get with the higher concentration of PHMB, which seems to be really safe. So I'm very excited about the outcome of the trial. John, this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. I mean, obviously, it's not for me to say that it, it's extremely valuable. Obviously, it's extremely valuable. Um, we talk about uh, practice of medicine and off-label use, but I mean, with, with acanthamoeba keratitis, it, 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 a lot of times, uh, I think practitioners are just sort of playing it by, by ear. Uh, and it, yeah. it, it'll, it'll be wonderful to, to have a standardized protocol. I want to thank you very, very much for, for, for bringing this, this information to, to me and incidentally to the people watching. A, a, and uh, for being so very generous with your time with us today. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you.